he's a legend. Like, he brings such good energy. He's an icon. He's iconic. Yeah, he's a pillar in the community, and he's been doing what he does in the city forever. He's, he's just amazing. Beautiful spirit, too. And it's beautiful to see his spirit comes through, through his music. He makes us happy. He loves us, and we know that. So we're very grateful to have him. Are you from here is. or no? no? Where are you from? New Jersey. Uh, I know, so far out. I moved well, out to the... Well, at least you're still sort of getting that, I want to say, essence of York, Jersey. Yeah, yeah. Out this way, because, you know, we, we kind of kid of being the New York of the West Coast. Yeah. You know, you got Manhattan, which is I San know. Francisco, and then Brooklyn is... Oh. If it weren't for the yeah. the winter, uh, I would yeah. probably still be out there. Yeah, <laughs> but I like the small town vibe. I really uh, like. like. I love the weather that we have here. I, know. I do not do snow. I don't, don't do humidity. I know. I'm good. Either. Heat, cold, fog. Yes. I know. I, I take a mid like 65 to 75. Exactly. Bags. Well, my dad was stationed in Germany. Yeah. That's really where I think I mentally started I guess even by the age of being seven or eight years old yeah. is when I really started to learn music and what I was liking and sounds and different effects and things like that and from there on it just became sort of sort of mainstay you know but but your Germany was was my place Frankfurt Germany is where we lived for two and a half years and it was it was great it was great great music great times Buying my dad beer, me and my brother, going to the trick halls, getting a six pack of whatever German beer my dad was loving at that time, and getting us tons and tons of candy. I think we broke half a six pack every time we would go down and try to bring it home because we'd be playing at the park on the way back. You know, good well, we were supposed to be home, but we did it. He was still happy. It was good. <laughs> oh, it's like a great upbringing. Like, yeah. really close yeah. friends. Very close. Still very close with them to this day. They're around. I love them, I talk to them all the time. Yeah. Can't do without my parents, so I love them dearly. We're gonna get to the electronic music. Okay. Um, first track you remember listening to, how old were you? Was there anyone in particular that like showed you that that track, that moment? Hmm. I don't know if there was anyone. You know, I can always refer to, you know, DJs playing this particular record or that record, which I have tons of Tons of yeah. people and lists and DJs and things of that nature. But I usually always tell people that when I got into house music, I think it was on a whim. I was living in Southern California and um, I'm a big radio fan. And that's what, that was our way of social media, was listening to the radio in those days. So hearing new music, instead of finding it online, we would listen to our local radio stations, and there was a station called um, called KGGF. No, yeah, KOLA, Cola, Triple Nine FM, and they used to play this record by two Puerto Ricans, a black man, and a Dominican. That was the name of the group. Yeah, really. And, uh, <laughs> That's a yeah, really long title. And the song, and the, they first had a song out called "Do It Properly," but their follow-up was called "So Scandalous," and that record was the beginnings of looking into magazines, which was another source of social, you know, 
80s, 90s social media, you know, updates, looking at charts from different radio stations and different uh, different areas of the world or, or the U.S. to find out who's playing this and what DJ was playing that. And that's sort of the beginnings of how I started finding out who was playing this, what that DJ was playing, or what this particular source of music was coming from. And that was my first taste of electronica. So what aspects of DJing drew you in? You've been into music for a long time, but what brought you to that level? To the DJ world? Yeah, or? yeah. Play instead of listen. I honestly, you know, originally when I got into the whole music game, I was really going into to be in radio. Yeah. And I, I am in radio. I have a radio show, or I do a monthly radio mix show in the UK on My Soul Radio, which I do a show called The Saturday Night Nasty Mix. In fact, I'm going to record that tomorrow. I'll do my air checks this weekend. We air the following week. So I got a method to my madness. What day but does it air? It's usually every last Saturday of the month. Perfect. Yeah, from 11 to... It's 11 to 1 on the West Coast, 2 to 4 on the East Coast, and then prime time, uh, 7 to 9 p.m. in the UK, where it's actually doing this live, normal broadcast. But I got into this field by, like I said, being in radio, but I've always wanted to DJ kind of play music. I had my first set of turntables when I graduated from high school back in 86. And I still have those turntables. They're new marks. And yeah. they're, they're, I've only played on them four times ever. And I kept them because my brother got it for me. It was like my first DJ setup that I ever had. And my brother got it for me. And I just keep it for sentimental value. Yeah, you know? It's a small take. It's, for it's sure, a piece of for your sure. history. But I, you know, kind of like how people are, people who do know my career know that I started down in Monterey, which mm -hmm. is the Central Coast, and started DJing at a local gay bar. But even with that, the rave culture was really big in the early 90s, so I was doing local raves and parties around town, and it just sort of started catapulting up and up from there, you know? Yeah. Next thing you know, I, I was working at the Monterey Bay Aquarium five days a week, and on Wednesdays I would drive up to San Francisco for my first residency at a place at a party called Tilt, which was at the old D Gate, which is now Temple in San Francisco. I didn't know that. That's crazy. That's been, <laughs> yeah, around, it's been around since around the nineties. It's had so many facelifts. It really has. So many facelifts. It really it's such has. a different club than even when I first went in 2010. It am, it's amazing now. As Temple's got all the great fanfare, you know, with that typical, you know, nightlife EDM style. But even bottle before that, us. the bottle, yeah. <laughs> but before that, it was just as fabulous in the late 80s and 90, early 90s on. Yeah. You know, the whole basement level used to be painted, was painted by Keith Haring. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't keep that's not well, that's, that's kind of crazy. There's, there's, there's some nostalgia around here and there. Yeah. There's a there's a poster uh, a key pairing poster that was from the DBA from DBA uh, over at Mobile Studios here in Oakland. So there's still some pieces around, but it was it was amazing. It was amazing. Talking about DBA, mm -hmm. that was one of the big things that led to your first commercial spot on your mama's house. What was that? How did that come about? That was the first of its kind in. Northern California, that was a pretty pivotal moment, that was... Well, your mama's house was started by my dear friend, Peter Vila, and Lawrence Petty, a.k.a. Foxy Brown. Um, they asked me to join, and I joined them in 95. Uh, but before that, they were doing... They had started the show, and was they were really doing their thing. And before they started your mama's house, there used to be a show called San Francisco Underground. And that was with Posh Corelli. And I listened to that station, living in Monterey and having my little radio with antenna, you know. We didn't have the fierce connections that we have now with just going on a computer and all that stuff. But it was, it was so... You know, when I think back on those days and trying to find music and listen to music, you know, we were searching. We, <laughs> diehards were out there, like, searching the best way they could. Where did you get it? In some way, shape, or form. Sometimes there'd be a, 
I remember playing Crystal Waters, the uh, Gypsy one with the La Da Dee La Da Da song. I can't believe I you just mentioned that. I recorded it on a cassette and I recorded off of Cameo's Underground show. And the station was, it was coming in, but then it would sort of go out. So it had like the static in the background a little bit because the station, the frequency was getting really bad. And I didn't care. I still played it at the gay bar and the kids lost their minds. So. So, in 2000, that's when you officially launched your production company, yeah, yeah. DHJ. Uh, you've gotten to work with some really, really, I mean, really iconic people. Uh, Luther Vandross, Alicia Keys, Aretha Franklin. Just to name us, like, a small snippet of, like, the many, many, many. Um, what motivated you to start your own production company to create music, maybe outside of the, the house music genre, the more maybe a little more commercially um, driven? That, I don't want to call it. I don't, I don't want to call it commercially driven. Oh, I, mean, it's, I want to it's, say it's maybe bring, more mass. Bring, mass it's um, bringing the mass to my dance floor. Okay, really, I would say mass. That's is really better. all I've been trying to do, and I still do it to this day. You know, I I love. I love commercial music. I love all the commercial. If you are a great artist and you do some great music, I get inspired by what you give in my ears in tranquility. I try to give it to my dance floor. So, for instance, like Luther Vandross, I got that from from knowing from the record label. I was a Billboard reporter for 16 years as well, so I reported to Billboard charts. You know, and I would get a lot of those promos and get off the pillows and I would just grab it and go into the studio and work, work on that with, with Chris Lund at the time was my, my producing partner. But DHA Productions was my entity for just being able to have my own shit, have my own stuff. I've always, like, late 80s, early 90s house for me has always been one of my favorites personally because of it wasn't what I got into at first, but like like falling in love with that genre, mm -hmm. learning about the history to come up from like the ballroom culture, like the queer scene, and just see how it turned from like disco and funk into its own special thing that grew out of hardship and not belonging and creating a space of belonging and celebration. You can hear that that in the music. You can I, hear that in the celebration, and that's why it still resonates so I love that. I love deeply. That. And I love that. And and. I think what makes your story different from mine is that mine has a black gay perspective mm -hmm. to it. And the music that I learned this from was from that very culture. Mm -hmm. You know, because a lot I'm from the days when you didn't even see straight kids up in the clubs. You know, I mean you saw maybe a few who were pretty comfortable with themselves, but the way you see it now, which I love that too, because I feel that I played a big part of bringing the gay world and the straight world. And of course, the way the gentrification and the way our, you know, kids are growing up these days and being very open-minded, I'm, I'm all for that. But there was a time where it wasn't like that. And I'm happy that I, I felt like I was kind of, I was a part of a little piece of that, you know. A big doing piece, that, yeah. actually, <laughs> honestly. Thank you, thank you. But, you know, I, I, I'm now wanting to express my music in today's society, but letting people know that, you know, this is a form of music that was, that was from a culture that a lot of people within my own culture do not accept to this day. Mm -hmm. I mean, you go to certain parts of the country or parts of the world and it's mayhem. You'll think like, oh, I'm gonna go to this party and there's nothing but brown and black people there. And you'd be like, whoa, it's not like how it is here in San Francisco. And that's not a bad thing. I just think that sometimes it's not discussed or mentioned. And it needs to because it's very important, it's very important that everybody understands the true genre of, of this culture that has now spawned to subcultures and subcultures and subcultures. And I just want to make sure that people know that what they are sort of dancing to is what today's culture is, but it has to be shown up in black gay culture. All right, <laughs> the final question. Yes. Any gigs upcoming or any current projects that you're working on that you would really like to share? I can share it all. 
Um, list it out. They it's pull a list. Like, it's a list. They bring it out. It's a list. <laughs> no, the dog can stay. Yeah, it's a perfect condition. <laughs> I, want, I want him on my lap, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Of course, I'm, I can't wait to play hospitality. I haven't played hospitality in a couple years. The first time I did play for them, I had the best time. So I'm so looking forward to this. Um, I'm also playing with Louie Vega, who's one of my dear friends. Patrick Wilson is also another amazing DJ, my dear friend. Uh, that's coming up. Uh, as far as production, ooh, I am doing a Ocha Records compilation for Carlos Mena and Cody Kofo, which I'm in the works on now. I'm doing some, some re-edits of some of their uh, tracks from the catalog, and we're putting it all on a mixed compilation, so I'm, I'm just starting to work on that. Uh, I'm finished, I just finished doing a remix for Anaya Day and doing another project for her. So I'm trying to finish that. And then I have Lady Ama, who is one of my dear friends. And we had an amazing record that I did with Cecil Cardinal uh, and Chris Lum. And we were calling ourselves the Rainmakers. <laughs> and she did this track called Let It Fall, which became a viral hit last year, well, last year and part of this year, and had millions and millions of views of this young African kid singing the song word for word in this video. So she came out, and she performed out here at Spirit House, and we got in the studio, and we're working on a follow-up called, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> right, at, right at the moment. So. That's really, I honestly, like, it was just, the energy and dedication and the spirit that like, you've had that's obviously unwavering oh, is very impressive. Oh, it's so easy to get jaded, especially when it's like it's a lot of work. It's a lot oh, of I could time. Be a bitch when I need to be a bitch, but why? But Don't yeah, want to see that. You, it's, it's like, <laughs> it literally sounds like you just yesterday discovered something that you're really excited about yeah. and talking about it like so Always. many decades. Like, like that's that's a really special thing. It, it, it's it a really is. Special it thing. is. It is. And you have to be. You have to have that to be able to continue the process of, of learning more about yourself, learning more about the music and the culture that you're in, and keeping yourself relevant. Oh. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you've kept yourself relevant for <laughs> sure. You're doing something right. I'm trying, girl. I'm trying. <laughs> so, um, David Harness plays um, on the 27th of this month. Uh, he has support from Jamie Velasco, our own Tobin Ellsworth. In the back room, we have James Houdini playing the Groove Lounge. It's going to be an incredible night. We're going to give thanks to House with Thanksgiving nice. the next day. Uh, it's going to be a special night. It's a big one, so definitely come join us. Come on out, y'all. Yeah, free champagne this. from 9 to 10, so let's have a little bubbly before we <laughs> get going. Work. That'll work. That'll work. Thank you so much. Cool. This is thank such you. a pleasure. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. That was